Ladies and gentlemen, may I welcome you to this um, book launch and discussion and debate, uh, which is being held jointly by the Danube Institute, of which I'm president, and by the Helena History Press. And um, I want to begin by thanking um, uh, the um, entrepreneurs um, behind the Helena History Press, uh, Catalin Kaidolin, who's with us today, for um, first of all being here, but also secondly for having arranged and organized the uh, publication of a translated uh, version of a great book. Um, the great book is the one you have in front of you, and, it, and which will be available later. It is the uh, it is called, entitled Lost Prestige, and it describes the, um, the way in which Hungary's image changed in Britain between the 1890s and the outbreak of war. Uh, that, of course, is a fascinating topic in its own right, but it's particularly fascinating at this point uh, because we're still in the 100th anniversary year uh, of the um, Trianon Treaty, and it was, in some part at least, as a result of the lost prestige that Hungary is, uh, had um, in, the, in the 1890s, but had lost by 1914, um, that Hungary received such shabby and disgraceful treatment in the Trianon Conference. It was not obviously the sole uh, reason, but it was an important one. It's true, of course, that at that conference there was a last minute um, feeling statement and feeling of regret uh, by Lloyd George, uh, then Britain's Prime Minister, as a result of the celebrated speech of um, uh, Count Aponyi. Uh, but that came late in the day. Um, it was an effort by Lloyd George uh, to, in a sense, reverse what everybody was beginning to see, though it was in the interest of many to deny, uh, was um, a, a, a an outcome of the uh, peace treaty for Hungary um, that was extraordinarily unfair to that country, but also probably uh, laid down the seeds of future difficulties in Europe, which indeed proved to be the case. Um, we're lucky on this occasion uh, to have the author, Keza Jezenski, an extremely distinguished historian, an extremely distinguished um, political um, a figure in Hungary, an extremely distinguished diplomat, and perhaps I should say, an extremely distinguished dissident, uh, a, group, a member of a group of distant, dissidents um, who helped to lay the foundations for the transformation of Hungary from communism peacefully uh, to a democratic society. And we're very grateful uh, that he is here. Um, I am in the middle of reading the book, and I'm enjoying it immensely. I. I must say, the influence of journalists, I speak as a journalist, is something I normally deplore. But on this occasion, it seems that uh, some of the British journalists who are writing um, about Hungary, though they may have, um, in a sense, damaged the country, they might not have done so if some of their views had been heeded earlier than the war, broke, when, when the war broke out. To, we will ask uh, uh, Dr. Zizensky to uh, speak to us. Um, after which I will invite two very distinguished historians, um, and uh, Tibor Frank and uh, um, Eva Beretsky uh, to, um, to um, comment, and then we will have a debate and questions from the floor. Um, all three uh, speakers today combine historical uh, knowledge, um, great re reputation as historians, but I think almost as important in this case, a, a deep knowledge of the English-speaking world in which they have um, worked and, and written. So I think we are in for an extremely important, but I expect also an extremely um, fascinating and lively debate and discussion. So, so on your behalf, um, let me, and on the behalf of the Helena History Press, let me welcome you here and invite Dr. Zizensky to give his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, ladies and gentlemen. It is an immensely great pleasure for me 
to have reached uh, this and, and to have lived until this date. Uh, originally, I wrote this book uh, more than 35 years ago. Uh, the publication was in, in, in 1986. And, uh, well, obviously, uh, since the subject, I hoped always that it would be available in English language. But for that, I needed a translation and I needed a publisher. Now, uh, the translation uh, was, in fact, uh, ready in the early 90s, and I don't know whether Brian McLean is not yet here. Uh, he, he indicated, that, well, he's a resident in Hungary, a British subject, I suppose, uh, but because of the pandemic, uh, he and his family was, I think, a bit concerned whether to make a presence here. But anyhow, so he translated it, but naturally, uh, obviously, Without uh, uh, the original translations, uh, as I, of course, translated the original English uh, diplomatic reports and uh, uh, extracts from books and protocols and, uh, of course, the Times uh, daily dispatches uh, into Hungarian. And there was, uh, uh, it was my duty, eventually, to fill the many vacancies in the translation by giving the English originals. At that time, in the early 90s, uh, as long as I was in government, obviously I had no time to do that. And uh, later on, I thought that, well, I needed about three months uh, because it was not an easy and automatic task. Uh, I never had the three months uh, ever since, especially as there was no uh, kind of threat or, or pledge uh, for an English publication or for an English publication. So it was a, some time ago, not long ago, that I came to know uh, Kati, uh, Kadar Kati, uh, the uh, owner, I suppose, uh, of the Helena History Press. And uh, having discussed many things, uh, well, she's, of course, uh, uh, not only a student of Hungarian history, but a graduate of Hungarian scholars, and I think Tibor was uh, her supervisor. Uh, so. Uh, this subject obviously not only interested her, but also fascinated her. And then came the uh, very nice offer uh, to bring out the book in English. Oh, then I set to work. Uh, there was no more delay. And it took more than three months. You can expect uh, a historian like myself, a professional, cannot uh, bring out a new edition in another language. Uh, uh, which uh, the person wrote 30, more than 30, 35 years earlier. So I didn't have to rewrite the book, and I always uh, insisted that I'd never felt that a book uh, written in the last decade of communism needed any substantial revision if, once, uh, if one wants to uh, come out with a new one. But uh, a scholar has to consider all, or as much possible, all the important uh, works, details, comments uh, pertaining to the subject, uh, which has uh, come out in the uh, more than three decades. So that uh, took me certainly some time. But uh, I had a little bit more leisure, so the result is uh, substantially more than the original uh, in, uh, Hungarian edition. And then uh, the good luck that uh, when I was already working on this uh, English version and uh, finding uh, my original notes, uh, Xerox copies, and, and looking up some other books. Then I uh, met uh, the owner and editor of Fekete a uh, smaller Hungarian publishing house. And as I was also uh, writing a, a little paper for a new edition of uh, General uh, America, U.S. General Bandholz Diary, which is now just coming out a new, much better edition. And I also added a, a preface or introduction to that book. So the uh, publisher offered me a new Hungarian edition. Then uh, I wouldn't say that I had to translate from the, my English version, the Hungarian one, but really based on my English manuscript, I could uh, add uh, more than a few sentences uh, to the, the Hungarian one. And I also added a chapter, which is not in uh, the American edition, but I recommend it, as uh, uh, John O'Sullivan was kind enough to offer to publish it in 
the Hungarian Review. So this new chapter is a, a counterfactual history. And I hope that it will interest, if not fascinate, many Hungarians and perhaps even some foreign readers. Because in this uh, last chapter, I started from the assumption that uh, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was really an ill luck. Uh, the first attempt failed, and uh, then there was just a mistake of the driver and the organizer of the whole uh, visit uh, that uh, his car stopped, happened to stop just in front of a cafe or pub where Gavrilo Princip uh, was very sad, uh, thinking that the attempt failed. And then there is uh, the car in front of him, so uh, he could uh, shot them point range, so from probably such a distance. I have no weapon here. Uh, so and I have no reason, of course. But Princip, I think Princip had no reason, really, uh, uh, to kill just that Habsburg, who was the kindest to the Habsburgs, and uh, was looking for his own reign uh, uh, to uh, somehow to emancipate uh, the non-German and non-Hungarian uh, peoples in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So I started from this, that saying that if the attempt had not succeeded, obviously the July 14, 1914 crisis uh, would have been unnecessary, and so the war uh, wouldn't have started. And uh, from starting from that, using contemporary records uh, of the Archduke, uh, uh, his uh, advisors, Hungarian and other advisors, and uh, uh, knowing the characters of the time, including Prime Minister Tisza and uh, both his friends and his opponents. So I wrote a chapter of Hungarian history starting with 1914 and ending in 1919. Uh, well, I hope uh, it uh, will interest you sufficiently. I just say that uh, in my story, uh, uh, the heir, of course, uh, ascended the throne, the, the Habsburg throne, coronated in Vienna. And the Hungarian coronation is delayed because of constitutional problems. So he, he uh, by royal decree, uh, introduces universal suffrage, which was, of course, the, the big debate of the time. Uh, and uh, uh, there are protests. And finally, uh, then after a new Hungarian election, which brings majority uh, to a government appointed by him, uh, based on universal suffrage. The great moment comes in the Matyash church, the coronation, and just before the, the crown of St. Stephen is put on his head, uh, an assassin from the crowd, a uh, Hungarian nationalist uh, MP, uh, kills him. So uh, on the same day when uh, uh, Charles IV uh, was coronated, was received the crown, then he, enter, he comes to the throne, and uh, before he really starts his own reign, uh, Tisza István, uh, who had to resign after the uh, death of Franz Josef, or Francis Josef, uh, he, in a big rally against universal suffrage, is killed by Ilona Duczynska, a Hungarian noblewoman, who planned to kill him, but uh, was prevented by many uh, various events. This tragedy, the death of the Prime Minister or the former Prime Minister, brings about a kind of spirit of reconciliation. And uh, in 1918, uh, a new government uh, by a former supporter of uh, Tisza, uh, Elemir Jakobfi, uh, who became well known in Transylvania, in Romania, uh, as an advocate of uh, Hungarian rights, but before that, he was uh, also advocating. Uh, the emancipation of the Romanians. So he becomes the prime minister and appoints Oscar Yassi uh, as uh, minister for the emancipation of the non-Hungarian minorities. And uh, he passes uh, those three laws, which we know from Hungarian history that he did introduce in 1918. And of course, then the new parliament passes them. The, and the King uh, Charles IV uh, sanctions this on April the 11th, just on the anniversary of the sanctioning of the April laws in 1848. So that is the happy ending of my story. And uh, it is not in the English version, but it is in the Hungarian version. So those who read Hungarian uh, can read it, and hopefully, uh, thanks to you. So I thought uh, that was more than enough for me as an introduction. And uh, I am too looking forward 
uh, to the opinion of two friends of mine who knows as much, if not more, about uh, Hungarian and English history and their connections as myself. Thank you. Um, it is said, you know, that human intelligence begins when the first man emerges from protozoic slime and carries on until somebody stands up to give a public speech. Um, I'm afraid I made two errors in my opening remarks. One is that I was supposed to tell you that at the end of the, our discussion, uh, the reception will, uh, if you're going to the reception, you should go through the next room and on to the third room at the back. The second is I afraid misnamed our second speaker, the distinguished historian, Agnes Beretsky. Miss Professor Beretsky. So, um, thank you very much. And um, so I have to tell you, before coming here, I looked at my bookshelf, and I already found two lost prestiges. And the first one I looked at was the 1986 edition, the little blue book. That was a real eye-opener for me during my studies as a history English I mean, student. And then the next one, uh, a presentation copy, uh, which I very much cherish, was of great value for my dissertation. And so now we are here to celebrate the third in English version, which, was a, which is a much more extended uh, lost prestige here with a bibliography amounting to 14 pages. And I'm absolutely sure that it is, and it certainly will be, an ind indispensable piece for professionals and public alike. So let me now say a few things, summarize in, in three points what I liked about this book very much. Firstly, the title, Lost Prestige. This is an incredibly telling title, as from a Western and more particularly a British point of view, one can interpret Hungarian history from the 1848 revolution up to the close of Cold War as, an alternating, as alternating periods of uh, high esteem, British high esteem, even admiration, or very critical periods. After 1920, however, a third option needs to be included, and that's ignorance or disinterest. Uh, I myself, um, an English MA person, probably feel that the other way, the uh, instead of prestige lost, uh, lost prestige, prestige lost would have been a little bit more emphatic title um, and a bit more dramatic too. Um, the second thing, apart from the title, is that I like is the fifth um, chapter because the author devotes this entire chapter some 50 pages on the constitutional crisis and rightly so. He calls the attention to the Hungarian jurists and politicians' extraordinary skill, as was quoted by Henry Wickham Steed. Their obsessive preoccupation with the formal ritual as a substitute for electoral and social reform. The debates over titles, hyphens, badges, flags, uniforms, and particularly the language of command in the army, some 70 words, dominated political life, Hungarian political life, up to the Great War. Chapter five reminded me of the popular nursery rhyme, for the want of nail, the shoe was lost, for the want of shoe, the horse was lost, for the want of horse, the rider was lost, and so on. And the rhyme ends with the exclamation, all for the want of a horseshoe nail. So can we argue that the horseshoe nail upon which, if not the kingdom, because it survived Trianon, but its integrity was lost, was the constitutional crisis, or more closely, the futile debate over some 70 words? I leave you with that question for a while. And explain that scholars generally agree that Trianon was the result primarily of the Entente wartime strategy and the lost war, and yet, the constitutional crisis was so significant because it had two very unfortunate results. Result number one was the military. Owing to this maniac preoccupation I was talking about with the constitutional question, the Hungarian parliament successfully blocked the modernization of the Austro-Hungarian army for more than a decade. So that was something unique in the region. And the Austro-Hungarian army, because of that, rapidly fell behind its rivals militarily and became fully dependent on the German high command decade later during the Great War. 
And secondly, and in line more with the book, the constitutional crisis destroyed the reputation of the Hungarian politicians, and more importantly, that of the Hungarian nation for several decades to come. As Los Prestige explains, after 1907 and 8, no one in England believed in the idea of liberal Hungary. But how long this negative image prevailed? And to illustrate the extent of the harm done, let me invite another British historian, Caroline Aylmer McCartney, whose papers I, I, I managed to read, and who was Sitton Watson's disciple first, then a pro-Hungarian opponent, and in Two weeks ago, I had a chance to do some research again, and I have come across a miscatalog letter written by McCartney, and let me quote a little bit about this. Quote starts, the trouble has been all along. He wrote it in 1934, so 20, uh, 14 years after the Treaty of Trianon. The trouble has been all along that the only people who enjoyed any reputation of having anything whatever about the country, Hungary, were uniformly hostile to it. And although a certain number of members of parliament and similar people from time to time made speeches about it, the immediate reply has been that they knew nothing about it, that they were only repeating what they were told from the other side, and that the real facts are quite different and will be found in the works of authorities referred to, brackets, hostile to Hungary, end of quote. As the fitting summary in Lost Prestige goes, all the wells were poisoned. Based on the vast amount of archival material, uh, Professor Yasensky sets out to prove that this long-lasting hostility towards Hungary was not due to the authorities, that is, Seaton Watson's or Steed's inborn hatred. There was no such thing, or any conspiracy. There were, were no such things. But primarily to the coalition politicians, and unfortunately, most of their colleagues, tragic lack of self-reflection and their unwillingness to react to criticism in a scholarly way. Their letters and articles reveal that the formerly great friends of Hungary, Seton, Watson, and Steed, they admired Kosciuk's people upon arriving to Hungary, both of them. They were addressed as paid agents, ticks, parasites, and usually as misinformed and unaware to the nuances of Hungarian history and politics. This was unfair and untrue. Both Seton, Watson, and Steed were intimately acquainted with Hungary, taking great pains to discover its landscapes. I once read, Steed wrote to a friend, I had to travel 9,000 kilometers, he used in miles, to get to know the country, so 9,000 kilometers. And both of them were intimately acquainted with Hungarian history and its constitution, and above all, they both learned Hungarian, and they were able to translate from Hungarian into English. Their unwillingness to accept natural assimilation, and almost all their one-sided arguments, and later distortions, who the Hungari which the Hungarians very clearly uh, were against and criticized, had very different roots. In their overlapping and sometimes conflicting identities as liberals, nationalists, and particularly in Steed's case, imperialist. Lost Prestige doesn't elaborate on this, but Seton Watson's and Steed's writings suggest that they both largely remained unaware of the interplay of these three layers, adherence to lofty ideas of justice, British foreign political considerations and interests, as well as personal ties and emotions. Nevertheless, despite these shortcomings, McCartney, we call him back again, could argue in 1937, quote, to modern writers, Professor Seaton Watson is anathema. I can, however, find no work from the other side still in 1937 to set against his, since his opponents either ignore or deny the problems of which he treats instead of explaining them. The reason Magyar view has yet to be expounded in any Western European language, McCartney argued. Meanwhile, he continued, Professor Seton Watson's works remain unsurpassed in any language as collections of the facts and utterances of Magyar statesmen and parliamentarians on the national question, end of quote. Let me complete. 
not only sit in what some works on Hungary were unsurpassed, but in the mid-war period, the tireless Oxford professor came up with the so far one of the best, if not the best, history of the Romanians in English, and later on with that of the Czechs and Slovaks too. Well, today we have gathered to celebrate a book that expounds the reason my view. And he, it does it so without shunning the very sad fact that after 1920, the Hungarians and the successor states were soon worse off as a minority than the non-Hungarian peoples of Hungary had been. The mistreatment of the Hungarian minority still lingers on. Thus, on the 100th anniversary of the Treaty of Trianon, the memory of the lost territory still sting. Yet, lost prestige is utterly devoid of two fairly typical Hungarian characteristics when talking about Trianon, self-pity and self-delusion. So the example has been set to follow at home and abroad alike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Tibor Frank who has a distinguished record of writing on this topic, but in particular I'd single out, given the, the other country involved, that you are a distinguished fellow of the Royal Historical Society in London. Thank you. And good evening to everybody. Uh, this is a, a welcome event for all of us who encouraged Giza to publish the English version of this book for the last, have been encouraging for the last 35 years. Uh, this is uh, uh, a tribute to the History Helena Press uh, and to its uh, director uh, that this happened now and we are very happy to have a very good English version of the book which I think will be of great interest to people in both Britain and the United States. Now, I would like to speak a bit about what happened before the time frame that is covered by uh, this book and what happened afterwards. Uh, what happened before uh, was the revolution of 1848-49, which uh, uh, was unsuccessful, unfortunately, and was, uh, uh, this was the result of a Russian attack on uh, Hungary in 1849. And uh, afterwards, many of the leaders were executed, particularly uh, the military leaders, but also some of the uh, excellent political leaders, uh, except for one uh, who was Lajos Kossuth, who was the uh, de facto head of the revolution, who uh, uh, left the country uh, immediately after the armistice and uh, went first to Serbia and then to Turkey. And in Turkey, uh, he uh, was uh, invited, or from Turkey, he was invited by the uh, United States government to pay a visit to uh, America. And uh, so he uh, took a ship which was sent for him by the American government, uh, and he left for France first and then for Britain. He stopped in Britain and then ultimately he left for the United States. This was in late 1851 and he stayed there for a little over seven months. Uh, this made him very well known internationally, not only in the United States, where he went to collect some more money to continue his revolution uh, if there would be enough arms and ammunition uh, on his return to Hungary, which never happened. He spent the rest of his life, a very long life, in uh, different countries, such as Britain and Italy uh, in the first place, uh, altogether some uh, 45 years in exile. He died in 1894, and I just uh, put a great emphasis on this date because this is more or less the exact time when the Hungarian government uh, back at home went over to a, a, an anti-minority uh, politics, particularly under Baron Dezső Bámfi, 
who was a um, spokesperson of this policy for several years. And uh, in between uh, the death of Lajos Kossuth and the end of the century, uh, Hungary changed a great deal from what it used to be and what it was uh, acknowledged for in the second part of the 19th century. Why is that important as an introduction to uh, Geza's book and the time frame of that book? Because uh, most people in and out of Britain and the United States, but also in Europe and elsewhere, uh, adored Hungary for the achievements of the revolution in 48, 49, and thought that Hungary is a, uh, a wonderful revolutionary country, a liberal country, a country with a great future. And uh, they uh, uh, put that in innumerable books and pamphlets throughout this uh, long second part of the 19th century. Uh, when Kosciuk died, uh, uh, a number of books came out uh, to praise him for his policies back in 1848. They still remembered in 1894 what he did in 1848-49. This is exactly the time when uh, young journalists such as uh, Robert William Seaton Watson and Henry Wickham Steed uh, first started to come to Austria-Hungary uh, and first uh, and, and uh, interestingly enough and that's a very good point uh, for all of us to remember and recall uh, the uh, young Seton Watson came to Hungary because he remembered Kossuth. He thought that Kossuth was the real leader of Hungary and he did a lot of good things for this country and he came to uh, various parts of Hungary uh, in order to uh, cherish the great uh, uh, spirit of Kossuth. And that changed, and that unfortunately changed in the next uh, decade and a half up until the First World War. Uh, Henry Wickham Steed uh, was less perhaps liberal in his uh, uh, thinking, but he also underwent great changes in the same time period. There was also a third person, a historian, who also wrote a lot about Hungary and also about the Paris Peace Treaties, a six-volume general treatment of the Paris Peace Treaties. That was Harold William Vase Temperley. So we are talking about uh, a, a number of eminent people, eminent in Britain, who uh, covered uh, what happened in Hungary in those years. And those years were not necessarily very uh, fruitful for Hungarian uh, politics. And uh, one is tempted to believe that some of the points that Seton Watson made were uh, right at that point. He had a number of, almost every year after 1905, he put out a different book. Uh, trying to explain the situation in the Slovak region of Hungary, that was then still Hungary, what is today Slovakia, uh, or the Transylvanian region of Hungary and other parts of the former Greater Hungary. Uh, this, in that sense, he really contributed a lot to the uh, uh, First World War and the aftermath of the First World War. Uh, when he became the Masaryk Professor of uh, uh, Central European History at the University of London, and as such a, a man of great prestige and great influence, which was not certainly very useful for Hungary at the peace treaties and afterwards. He published uh, this enormous 600-page uh, 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 history of, Romain of the Romanians, uh, in 1933, 1934, and that is an interesting period. This is when the uh, post-war Hungarian government under uh, Istvan Count Batlan uh, realized for the first time that they have to, have to do something for the, for the treatment of Hungary outside the country in the English-speaking world. 
So uh, Batlan, who was a, a, an eminent uh, statesman uh, and a clever political figure, uh, came to uh, uh, England, visited London and Cambridge, and gave a few, uh, some four different major speeches or lectures in England. And then these were published in both Hungarian and English in 34. And I think that uh, gave the idea to Batlan that they should start a new journal in English, which would then reach out to the English-speaking world and explain what Hungary is all about and how unjust the peace treaty of Trianon uh, was. This became the Hungarian, uh, the first major Hungarian journal in English and was uh, the Hungarian quarterly. Uh, something which we miss today very much because it's, it, it has disappeared from the scene. Uh, because uh, the first Hungarian quarterly came out in '36 for the first time and was available until 1944, early 1944. And it was a good paper. It was uh, full of information about Hungary and uh, mostly good information, reliable information. Of course, they were uh, trying to uh, uh, to fish for uh, the goodwill of Britain and the United States. They had their whole circles in those two countries, and they were trying to uh, uh, get articles from uh, members of the House of Lords. Uh, in some cases, they wrote, the editor in Budapest wrote the article for some members of the House of Lords, and then they were published as such for uh, uh, for the uh, for, for influencing uh, the international uh, public opinion, this is the outcome, I think, of the uh, Seton Watson period. Uh, Seton Watson was very effective in those years in the 1930s. Not only was this book the history of the Romanians, which is to date the best. Romanian history book in English, uh, but also he was very active in giving uh, uh, lectures everywhere in and out of Britain, and he was uh, was the uh, actual shaper and maker of public opinion in Britain uh, about Hungary even well after the First World War. Uh, this is a very sad story, by the way, uh, how uh, those governments in the very end of the 19th century uh, could uh, really destroy the uh, liberal and free image of Hungary that it enjoyed under Lajos Kossuth uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, this is the beginning of a long series of, of problems for Hungary in the uh, English-speaking world. Uh, we still uh, try to fight this uh, with uh, papers that exist today, like the Hungarian Review, uh, and some books in English. There are more books today in English than ever uh, before in the, in the um, uh, pre-First World War period. Uh, but one has the feeling that uh, nothing is enough to shape foreign opinion. Uh, in the English-speaking world uh, about Hungary. The same is true to the French, uh, the Francophone world, where we do less and, I think, not enough. Uh, there are some books also uh, produced in those countries about Hungary, but this is a major subject. Uh, who is writing what about a country today and uh, what is the uh, what, what is the general opinion about Hungary uh, today, and how does this relate to the earlier image of the country at that time uh, that Geza uh, addressed uh, in his book? Uh, I think it's a very good book, partly because it, uh, it is based on archival material. Uh, he was able to go to Britain uh, for some time uh, in the uh, early 1980s and uh, collected some material from the National Archives and from some other uh, collections. And that uh, obviously is there in the book. 
so you can enjoy uh, first-hand information about uh, these uh, uh, journalists and historians, what they were doing. Not only are these three people represented in the book, they are uh, many uh, pamphlets and articles and studies and books uh, brought up uh, more or less from the middle of nowhere uh, in, in the book by Geza, who did, I think, a very good job, uh, particularly at the time when uh, uh, this was just not available, this was not just done, this was not even possible uh, uh, to, to be done. This was 1986 when this was first published, as uh, uh, s several of us told you already. Uh, I think uh, it is a good book also because it is uh, bringing up a whole world which is largely forgotten, and that is the pre-Trianon world. We don't understand Trianon without this book and how uh, the British and the French governments, to a great extent also, the American government uh, turned against uh, the uh, losers of the First World War, obviously Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. These were the five losers. And I think uh, the losers had a bad lot. Uh, they lost a lot of territory. Hungary lost, as you probably know, something like two-thirds of its territory. and. Uh, uh, about two-thirds of its population. So the population went down from 21 million to roughly about 8 million. Uh, this was the uh, largest uh, loss uh, among these five losers of, of the uh, uh, war. And uh, it paved the way, and this is where I want to finish my uh, little introduction, to, to, tonight, uh, it paved the way towards Hungary's participation in a, a German alliance uh, up until the end of the Second World War. That's the very sad part of the whole thing, because Hungarians believed, Hungarian governments as well as ordinary people, through the whole period between the two world wars, believed that uh, uh, Germany is their natural ally. Germany can help them. Germany and Italy, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary traveled to Italy in 1927 already to try and convince the Duce to help Hungary. And that went on and on and on, uh, even uh, in the Hitler times. And uh, it, as I said, it paved the way towards uh, a, a, a pro-Hitler policy through the worst years of the Second World War. And it ultimately contributed, I mean, Hungary parted with Germany far too late, which was, uh, a, a, which is the subject of a different uh, book and a different uh, uh, lecture. Uh, I think, however, the total destruction of Hungary in 1944-45 was the result of this pro-German policies at that time. Uh, I think I, stop here and we invite some questions and comments from the audience uh, if there are any and uh, try to answer them if possible. Thank you. Professor Frank, thank you very much. Now, um, I'm going to invite uh, Geza Jozenski to respond to the um, two commentators and then I'll ask a question to the panel and then we'll throw it open to the floor. Yes, you uh, thank you very much. First of all, I am very grateful uh, to my uh, friends and commentators, and I did not expect uh, uh, them uh, uh, to be so controversial that I have to defend uh, my thesis, but neither did I expect uh, them to praise me too much so that I should blush. But uh, uh, we know this uh, old, very wise Latin saying, habent sua fata liberli, and uh, I think uh, I am really very lucky in the sense that uh, not only I was able to bring out an English and also a new Hungarian edition after 35 years, but uh, uh, the time has, which has passed, and especially the, not only the 100th anniversary of the peace treaty, but uh, uh, the comments and writings about that make, uh, makes my work uh, more topical than I had, I had ever thought. 
because when I started to write on this book, I was not sure how much uh, it influenced uh, the peace treaty. And my conclusion was that really uh, the very fact that we uh, lost our great reputation contributed very substantially uh, to the very harsh and unfair treatment which Hungary received. And actually, uh, evidence there is uh, in the archives and uh, in other sources that, in fact, those uh, British experts who were working in the, at the Paris Peace Conference in the territorial committees, which were, in fact, uh, drawing up the border lines, uh, were all more or less the uh, disciples, the students of Seton Watson, and uh, that influenced their decision in the actual delimitation of the border. Whether what uh, happens to Chalokas, this the gross uh, shit, uh, shit island, uh, which is a purely Hungarian territory but passed uh, to Czechoslovakia, uh, the railway line on the Hungarian-Romanian border. So uh, these very borders were the results of these experts and not of the uh, leaders. So in fact, uh, my original research uh, uh, brought me to the point that yes, uh, a nation which uh, wastes the sympathy which it has accumulated by its, let's say, 19th century conduct uh, uh, can suffer very uh, really. And of course, those who especially suffer, the Hungarian, the more than three million Hungarians who were detached from Hungary, were the victims, but were they the victims of uh, Rob, uh, Wickham Steed and Seton Watson? After the First World War, many Hungarians thought that they were the grave diggers of the monarchy. And uh, so the, the, uh, the harsh treatment or the harsh recognition of their work before the First World War increased after the uh, end of the war. And the, in fact, uh, in the original work, my last chapter was a study, not simply of the historiography of uh, pre-war uh, Hungarian history and the British and their foreign reactions to events in Hungary, but really how the Hungarian mind, how Hungarian, uh, well, politicians, leaders, uh, authors, and ordinary people uh, looked back at uh, this lost uh, prestige. And uh, it was interesting uh, to see that after the anger, understandable anger, such great authors like Jula Sekfu wrote, uh, yet as he did not uh, uh, think that uh, Seton Watson uh, should be praised, but he said that he was the first uh, village explorer of old Hungary. And uh, in, in, the journal, in the daily paper, Magyar Nemzet, which was an anti-Nazi paper, there were several other writings uh, like uh, by István Gál, who was the greatest uh, author of uh, British-Hungarian relations, and uh, Tibor uh, was very much instrumental in the new edition of many of his writings. So he uh, pointed out that, in fact, uh, uh, those British critics of the old Hungary uh, were, in fact, uh, well-wishers of Hungary as well, uh, and uh, uh, the much better reactions should have been uh, to listen to them and actually, I also point out that uh, at first these people were pro-Hungarian, uh, very much attached uh, not only to Kossuth, but, but uh, uh, they were very well received by many Hungarians, including uh, Kossuth's friend and the English uh, envoy, uh, Ferenc Pulski, and uh, his daughter, Pauli Pulski, and others. So in fact, uh, the story is more dramatic that uh, Hungary had so many friends uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, and uh, some of them uh, really uh, supported Hungary until the Hungary became the enemy of Britain. But uh, these critics uh, said the same, which like uh, which many contemporary Hungarians, like Oskar Jászi, but uh, to some degree, uh, Tisza also recognized the need to uh, to placate the Romanians. Uh, which, in fact, sadly, uh, Istvan Betlen at that point, uh, point did not uh, approve. I also uh, write about that, that in this new edition and also the Hungarian edition, I could place more emphasis on, on these uh, lessons of history. But uh, what uh, was even more important and perhaps more sad, that uh, uh, not rewriting, but revising my manuscript, I was very much, I could not escape that we are, again, Hungarians making the same mistake uh, in these very years. That uh, 
we are receiving a lot of criticism, also praise from abroad, and uh, the reaction uh, is more, more or less exactly the same which uh, was the reaction uh, in the 10 years before the outbreak of the World War. Uh, uh, pointing out that, yes, some of this criticism is biased, is exaggerated, is not even true, but uh, not seeing that there is a point, sometimes a very important and valid point in the criticism, and uh, it would be wiser, this is what for me, and I hope for many of my contemporaries, history and this book may show that uh, it is uh, wiser uh, not to throw away friendships, but rather to acquire friendships. And uh, on this 100th anniversary, there has been a lot of discussion and talk about, uh, well, uh, what a terrible fate has befallen upon Hungary, and, uh, well, anger and sadness, uh, uh, understandably. But uh, I think that some of the reactions, uh, including my own writings, I wrote quite a few pieces on that, that uh, uh, we should, if we want to improve the lot of the Hungarians outside Hungary, and if we want uh, to again regain uh, the sympathy of the world, which we acquired in 1848-49, which we acquired in uh, 1956, and we again acquired in 1989, with the role Hungary and Poland played in the fall of the communist dominoes. So uh, we must uh, rather uh, take criticism to our heart, and I always quote Gyula Iyes, the great Hungarian poet, who, among others, really in 1943, said that, well, the Hungarian typical reaction is just to, to cry out how unfair and uh, try to refute the criticism. But his advice was, and I think that is very valid today, that first we must read uh, uh, what is truly, uh, to, what is true in the criticism, and we must change those, let's say, bad habits, and we must listen to the uh, well-meant advice, and only then can we turn, the, can, should we turn uh, to what uh, should be rightly criticized and what should be refuted. Uh, so my, my uh, happiness uh, on this occasion that I have practically at the same time uh, an English and a Hungarian edition is the wish which I think most historians sustain but uh, don't, are afraid to say that the uh, hope that one can learn from history. This is the text of my Latin textbook, which at the age of 14 I first met, Historia est magistra vitae, Historia distimus, non vitae, non, his, uh, 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 non uh, score sed vitae distimus. So it is not uh, for, uh, uh, for the school, for uh, learned audiences which I, for which or for whom I wrote this book. But really, I uh, hope that this book will have a kind of uh, response uh, and people will read it uh, with the understanding that uh, Trianon was largely due to losing our friends and uh, we must acquire friends if we want to change not the borders of Hungary, but if we want to change the treatment meted out to the, non to the Hungarian minorities in the neighboring states, and if we want to, again, to be as uh, popular as we had been uh, 120 years ago. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me now ask, if I may, a question to all three of you, same question, um, beginning with uh, Professor Frank. And it, um, in a sense, arises from the title of the book, Lost Prestige. Yesterday, I happened to be moderating a discussion um, with um, Professor, among other people, Professor Tom Barchoy, Professor of History at uh, Ryerson in Toronto, but of course also uh, born in Budapest, a Transylvanian, and I think the cousin of Count uh, Mikhail Karoly. Um, and he said, and this directly addresses the question of prestige, he said that the, when the, uh, at the close of the First World War, um, the Times wrote an editorial, presumably written by Wickham Steed, in which, which ended by saying, and we must ensure that once, that in future there could be no repetition of this kind of event arising from the ambitions and, um, uh, and outdated views of Prussian Yonkers and Magyar oligarchs. And um, 
Professor Marchai went on to say about this comment, he said, that of course grossly exaggerates the degree to which Hungary was responsible for the war. It's prestige of a kind, but a very a black prestige, so to speak. Um, and I have two questions, really, of all of you. One is, um, did perhaps lost prestige topple over into a grossly unfair prestige? And secondly, how do we fit into that uh, notion, if, if it's one you accept, um, uh, how do we fit into it the final moments of the Trianon Treaty in which there is the appearance of regret and realization that Hungary's treatment has been unfair in response to the famous speech of Count Apony and, um, and an attempt not long sustained, of course, um, by Lloyd George um, uh, to, in a sense, moderate, if he could, the terms of the treaty. Right, so if you read uh, the book written by Harold Nicholson, who was the British, uh, one of the British diplomats uh, during uh, the Paris Peace Treaty, and there he puts down that one of the biggest problems during the treaty was that originally there meant to be two treaties. One, the preliminary conference, where the winners come together, discuss what they want, and the winners opted for the maximum, clearly, because they were sure that their wishes will be, in a way, not fulfilled. But then conference fatigue set in, and uh, the, final com the final conference never happened, where they originally had invented to, uh, intended to invite the losers as well, and during heated debates and discussions, some kind of a compromise was about to be reached. So one of the big problems, I think, is truly this conference fatigue. So there was a point when they said, okay, enough is enough, and let's not talk about that anymore, right? Um, and the second thing about um, Hungary, that the aim of, of war always is to win war. And as Professor Thibault Frank mentioned, that was the first wholesale big war. And the aim of Britain and, and the Entente was to gather as many um, supporters and allies as possible. And how can you gather allies? Well, you promise territories, how big, as big as you can. And so that's why I mentioned that uh, wartime strategy was very important in, um, was, was an important player in the, in the whole story. And uh, together with uh, conference fatigue, and of course, those who were sitting there, we all know, uh, Harold Nicholson even said, we never moved a yard without asking the then President Seaton Watson and Steed, who were not uh, officially uh, members who drew the borders, but they were there hiring a flat clothes, and they talked and met. So prestige was important because these people who actually held their very pencils, they were counseled and advised by Seaton Watson and Steed. Thank you. Could I just ask the question? I'm agreeing entirely with what has been said, but if the victors were out to, uh, what was it? I think the English phrase was, squeeze Germany till the pips squeak. How come it was that G Germany was not nearly as um, hit by the peace terms as Hungary was? Well, uh, indeed, it was the German question uh, which uh, guided the whole story, even before the uh, outbreak of the war. And uh, uh, commenting what uh, Tibor said earlier, that uh, yes, it was the 19th century image and reputation which, uh, in, uh, which was prevailing before the war. I would add something, that uh, in the early 20th century, the British and uh, Seaton Watson and even more Steed expected Hungary uh, to influence the foreign policy of the monarchy to restrain Germany. Uh, well, they did not think that the war would break out inevitable, but uh, the German tendencies, uh, aggressiveness, building the fleet, uh, uh, cultivating the Muslim world, so certainly worried the British, perhaps understandably. And uh, uh, from the whole monarchy, but especially from its stabilizing and liberalizing force, this is what they called Hungary, they expected uh, that uh, Germany's ambition uh, will be curtailed because there will be uh, no brilliant second, there will be no uh, real reliable ally 
of, for Germany in case of a real conflict. Uh, now, uh, uh, McCarthy, uh, who was the younger colleague of Seton Watson, and that originally they were quite on good terms, but uh, whereas McCarthy supported the minor revision of the Hungarian borders, especially the first Vienna Award, Seton Watson broke uh, with him, and well, Agnes wrote an excellent uh, book uh, on, on this uh, issue. But McCartney, in his uh, magnificent uh, history of the Habsburg Empire, he says uh, that uh, before the war, yes, there was, were these critics, but uh, besides them, uh, there were many English authors who were continued to be sympathetic to the Hungarians. If the war had not come, perhaps uh, this criti criticism would not have prevailed. So if Hungary, perhaps even if Hungary had uh, remedied some of the faults of it. And uh, even at the end of the war, even Nicholson, who uh, professed himself to not to like, even so, certainly to dislike the Hungarians, very often he's quoted that that Turanian race added very little to civilization and so on. But he also, in the British spirit, wanted to be fair. So uh, he also advocated better borders for Hungary. And uh, uh, how is it uh, that, uh, uh, well, this German question, uh, that the Germans uh, re received that easier treatment? Well, I think uh, on the one hand, uh, Germany had to be tr uh, still treated in a somewhat more fair way because uh, it was expected that Germany will remain there, and especially with Russia, into Bolshevik Russia, a kind of counterweight in the person of Germany was also expected, so uh, not to humiliate Germany too much, although the Germans uh, thought that they were terribly humiliated and Hitler's rise was really due to the Versailles Treaty. Uh, but uh, really why Hungary lost much larger amount of territory and population than Germany? It was not simply because Germany was a, a bigger power and important power, but simply uh, Hungary as a result of the Pro, uh, post-Ottoman Empire, uh, post-Ottoman wars, uh, was re repopulated and repopulated uh, by uh, Romanians, uh, German Sex uh, or Sa Schwabians, uh, Rome Serbs, and so on. So uh, Hungary, uh, as you, we could see that already in 1914, and even more uh, in 16, when Romania made the, uh, the secret treaty of Bucharest and was promised uh, Eastern Hungary, uh, not more than Transylvania. So Hungary was the country which could be offered as a kind of uh, uh, prey, as a kind of reward for countries to bring in, to come back, to come in, into the poor. First it was Italy. Italy had to be promised, of course, the, the South Tyrol, or Tyrol and, and uh, Istria and others. Serbia to sustain its very hard struggle was promised already at the beginning of the war Bosnia-Herzegovina and southern part of Hungary. And uh, the Russians uh, already in September 1914 uh, gave a pledge to Romania, uh, just if uh, Romania remained neutral, uh, would receive Transylvania at, after the victorious war. So in fact, uh, Hungary willy-nilly uh, was a country which could be uh, offered. Uh, and uh, at the end of the war, uh, well, that was the way to uh, to win, uh, to dissolve, to promise uh, very generous borders uh, to the neighboring or to the uh, nations uh, of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So it was to some degree uh, bad luck uh, that Hungary had to pay. It was certainly not something that uh, uh, the world, the outside world, had a kind of uh, uh, inborn dislike or hate of Hungarians. Today, at this 100th anniversary, there are such voices in Hungary which say that the whole world war was caused uh, uh, by the, the British, the French, just in order to destroy Hungary and uh, to destroy uh, the thousand year old kingdom. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm going to throw open the discussion to questions from the floor. And I think so, our distinguished guest, Romanian ambassador, is. Uh, is uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, my, my name is Marius Lazurka. I'm the Romanian ambassador to Budapest. 
Um, I, I'd like to congratulate uh, Minister Jasensky, dear Geza, for um, this um, wonderful book. I haven't read it, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to, uh, to, to reading it. Um, let me also congratulate the, the panelists and the Danube Institute for uh, having organized this event and for having uh, invite, invited me to, to this, um, to this uh, book presentation. I'm, I'm not the only ambassador in, in, the, in the room. Uh, there's the Mexican ambassador, the uh, Croatian ambassador, not, not the only um, diplomatic representative. So um, I, I think that you, uh, we could have a, even a diplomatic um, debate around this uh, topical uh, subject uh, of, of, of ours. Let me also say uh, uh, a word of congratulations to the editor of this book and, uh, and explain, uh, because uh, I think that my presence here invites a question, why, why am I here t t tonight? And uh, this is a book, um, as, as Minister Yesensky uh, said, about um, not only lost prestige, but also lost friends. And I, I'm here essentially uh, towards the end of my presence in Hungary to, to uh, give assurances to Minister Jasensky that you haven't lost a friend in me. And uh, that um, um, I, I, I might have a, um, a way to prove this. I will look for a Romanian editor for your book if we can, uh, if we can negotiate uh, um, um, the, the copyright for, for this with, with your English editor. This is all I uh, had to say. Thank you. May I have the next question, please? Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. David Thompson. I'm a British citizen and long-term Hungarian resident. Um, firstly, I've bought the book. I haven't yet read it, but what I've heard in the last hour has made me look forward to it with even more um, enthusiasm than I ha had before. Uh, one of the comments that has, was made by you, Geza, was about the sort of Hungarian focus or the way that we are in Hungary and there is a natural way of looking at Hungary as the center. Um, I think a former, uh, a, a great novelist and politician and even organizer of the um, emperor's coronation in Hungary, uh, Banfi, talked about uh, the Hungarian globe. And that's almost inescapable in this setting, but I think there is more context. Firstly, and I don't say this with any pride, but if we think of the start of the Second World War, the British Prime Minister Chamberlain referred to uh, Czechoslovakia as a small, faraway country, and Hungary is a further away country. So the British can be very isolated, isolationist. But we should remember that in 1914, and particularly with uh, Mr. O'Sullivan here, the question of home rule existed within Britain then, and a parallel it does today. Then it was Ireland, but it was also Scotland. Uh, today it's, it's mainly Scotland, but it's also Northern Ireland. So we have talked so far today of the, uh, what happened at Trianon, which was the second and less, from a Western British perspective, important treaty than Versailles which was the one with Germany. Um, we've, we've talked about the, my, the other countries, but firstly, and I go back to Banfi and his um, Transylvanian trilogy, there is much discussion of Franz, uh, Franz Ferdinand and his advisors about breaking up Hungary. Perhaps people think that Franz Ferdinand was anti-Hungarian. Um, I think that's widely thought. Um, but secondly, there were the Americans saying, what about the rights of the minorities or the, the freeing some of the peoples? And we've mentioned perhaps uh, Istria, uh, Croatia, but there was Slovakia, which was part of Hungary for a thousand years. 
It ceased to be part of Hungary in 1920, but there's been no enthusiasm from those countries to become part of Greater Hungary again in the century since. And that needs to be reflected on as well. So those, those are the sort of points I wanted to make. There is a wider context and there are other points of view and that home rule and minorities was not just a question in Hungary um, at, at the time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have been recently focusing on Seton Watson Steed and uh, two other uh, Britons, and not just concerning the attitude uh, about nationalism within uh, the Greater Hungary, but also uh, their attitude to nationalism within their own empire, which is a very interesting uh, topic, how, how they viewed the Irish home rule uh, aims. And we all know that they more or less wanted to offer the same, at least Sid Watson and, and, and Steed, uh, more or less wanted to uh, offer uh, home rule. Uh, and Steed even himself as, as the foreign editor of the Times and then leading editor of the Times, he launched a campaign for Irish home rule, but nothing more. This is important, nothing more. So you see this discrepancy, right in, staying in Versailles, kind of disrupting this country and at the same time not allowing independence for the Celtic Irish. So that was happening. So give them rights, but not too much. And if you look at uh, Egypt, and we look at uh, some, some other dominions, India, that's even more interesting. They couldn't really think about an independent Egypt at that time. So your point is, is very interesting that there are two parallel understandings of nationalism. Yeah, there's no nostalgia now in Britain for, say, Indian independence in 1947. Yeah, that's right. nostalgia in Hungary in 1920. Yeah. The, uh, the home rule question is important already in the 1880s when Gladstone, in Parliament in 1886, uh, compared uh, the Irish home rule problem with the uh, successful uh, compromise between Austria and Hungary. And that he sort of offers a good example to the, uh, uh, to the British try and come to terms with the Irish in the same way as the Austrians did with Hungary. So I think this is a, a comparison which comes up again and again in uh, already earlier than Glasgow, uh, but this is a recurrent problem uh, in British thinking, uh, how the uh, Central European situation can be used as a comparison for Britain. Just to comment on the rule crisis in Ireland. Um, of course, um, the, the, the First World War was the, monk, was the factor which meant that the, the movement towards home rule was blocked. There had been an agreement. Um, it was uncertain given Ulster's somewhat uh, fall, faint falling resistance. It was uncertain how it would all work out. But at the same time, the putting it into coal storage until the end of the war that produced, of course, the militarization. The, the, first of all, the rebellion in 16, and then the arrival back in Ireland of soldiers in the British Army who obviously um, were, were of nationalist sympathies, and they then became the, the focus, obviously, or the, the core of a military resistance, and, the, and we know what happened after that. So, I mean, I agree. All of these, the, the First World War um, interrupted and derailed a lot of very interesting experiments that might have been peacefully carried out. But I'm afraid that's a very cliched thing to say, and alas, uh, it's one of those cliches that are very true. Let me, uh, uh, yes, the gentleman over there, and then I think there's a gentleman here who has a question. Uh, well, I'd like to speak to the Irish question too, because in uh, 1918, the Irish Home Rule Party was completely wiped out, and it was replaced by Sinn Féin. And Sinn Féin was led by Arthur Griffith, who was, of course, the author of The Resurrection of Hungary. And the entire Sinn Féin political position was essentially based on a Hungarian political compromise of 1837, sorry, 1867. So my point is that uh, if you say that uh, prestige has been lost, uh, then that means that prejudice has been created and as part of that creation of prejudice, the identification of 
uh, Hungary with Irish nationalism must surely have been a factor. Thank you very much. I'm Croatian ambassador here in Budapest. Uh, Minister Jesenski, yes, uh, we know each other for years and thank you very much for this additional endeavor and, and what you did also in this lingua franca of English. Well, uh, as Professor Berezki mentioned, what comes first? Is it prestige or lost, or loss, uh, uh, on one hand. On the other hand, we are in 21st century. Uh, although being here mingled with historians or, or mostly pro-historians, I'm just a humble economist. So <laughs> allow me to, to mention, we are in the, in the very, uh, uh, interesting world of uh, 2020s with, with all these COVID measures and with masks, without masks, whatever. But uh, all, all the challenges has come through COVID here with us. And, and uh, now we have additional points. We have some lessons from, from the past. Uh, uh, the analysis, which shows, as you bravely said, mentioned in, in your pledoye at the beginning, um, that some of the lessons are not so good for Hungary. Uh, and, and Hungary haven't even learned uh, enough. I wouldn't say that Croatia has learned everything or, or <laughs> just the best from its past, but, or Romania or whoever, or UK with all the prestige uh, that it has uh, still. But it's 21st, 21st century, 28 minus one to come uh, first. We are always speaking about Europe, but we are in the European Union, believe it or not. But every time we are speaking about Europe, here in Budapest, most of the times. Uh, we are also speaking about Hungary, or even Great Hungary in the Austro-Hungarian times, but it was Austro-Hungarian Empire, frankly speaking. Or, I mean, some of the things should be said as they are, or as they were. Uh, uh, too much interpretation sometimes, uh, from this angle or that angle. Maybe, maybe, uh, more, more, more uh, forward outlook. Maybe uh, looking for, for what is in common. Maybe for uh, asking for more solidarity even. This could, this could help us more than dividing again. In this way or that way or this. So, so these cuttings always hurt. So, Maybe, maybe to find some, some brighter <laughs> perspectives instead of, uh, uh, I, I don't understand fully uh, uh, the suffering and, and uh, the, the mm, uh, missing points, uh, opportunities, whatever. But at the end of the day, we are here and we're looking for tomorrow. So, so that's my plea, but, but the book is brilliant as much as I, because my Hungarian doesn't allow me to, to tackle your Hungarian edition, but, but this, what I heard, is brilliant. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much for your uh, uh, nice words, comments. Uh, and before I uh, comment on that, uh, just something on the Irish question, that uh, Arthur Griffiths, uh, the maker of Ireland, who may be called, uh, was obviously looking at Hungary uh, as not simply as an example for Ireland, but uh, the so-called compromise, the settlement between uh, the dynasty and the Hungarians in, in 1867. Whereas uh, uh, those Hungarians, quite a few who sympathized with the Irish, were the so-called Hungarian nationalists who wanted uh, a break with Austria, or at least a personal union, uh, replacing the dualist uh, system. Uh, but uh, I think what is really important is that uh, uh, 
Uh, this is an important link uh, uh, between, sorry, I can't find my, no. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, uh, the Irish uh, uh, remembers, uh, remember Griffith and uh, the Hungarian link perhaps more than the Hungarians and uh, uh, we should also uh, know more about that and my book also tried to bring out this question. Well, this uh, uh, Croatia, of course, uh, this Hungarian, the critics of Hungary uh, dealt very much uh, with Croatia and uh, sympathetically, uh, although eventually, uh, especially Seton Watson uh, endorsed the so-called Southern Slav idea, the unity, uh, and uh, Seton and, and uh, Wickham Steed, on the other hand, was instrumental in trying to bridge the very substantial difference during the war between Supilo and uh, other Croatians uh, exiled uh, and uh, the Italians. Uh, who of course coveted much territory, which in fact was inhabited by Croatians. Uh, but uh, to have a positive or a, uh, a more promising uh, message, uh, well, the book uh, also, uh, is both the critics of contemporary Hungary and uh, those who defended it, uh, like uh, uh, the, the in Hungary very little known uh, Leo Amery, the school friend of Churchill and uh, later on cabinet minister, uh, whose grandmother was a Hungarian Jew, uh, which he was not trying to hide a little bit, uh, but he was proud of his Hungarian background. And uh, I think uh, among all these British uh, uh, observers and authors on the Austro-Hungarian problem, his memorandum is the best because it advocates uh, a solution not based on the narrow national nationalist idea, but on a more European. So his memorandum is advocating a kind of uh, supranational union, a federalized monarchy, and actually uh, a forerunner of the European Union. And I always thought, and especially in the last 30 years, uh, that uh, the only solution for Trianon is the European Union and uh, the very principles which uh, should guide all the countries of the European Union, respect for rights of human rights and respect for the rights of national minorities. And I think uh, we can all agree upon that. Uh, let's hope that all the politicians eventually they will come to agree on that. Thank you. There's another question here, and I think a question behind. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello, I'm Amy Modley. I'm a Hungarian-American, um, educated in the US, uh, but fluent in both languages, work as a translator also. My question is that uh, the um, perspective of loss of prestige is a very specific uh, view, as in focus, and there are so many others, and the one that concerns me is that <clears throat> Trianon is also a, use, a loss of identity for Hungary as I see it. And um, my concern is on its 100th anniversary is that the loss of identity um, left Hungary with a sense of it being a cripple that uh, it's often referred to as uh, uh, the country being truncated, that it's, it's a cripple and this psychological position for Hungary, I think, affects and influences its current and always politics and that there's an element of victim still. And so my question is, when will Hungary, and I put this forward to everyone, um, find healing over this and move on into the 21st century and, and accept its history and move forward uh, as opposed to carrying the weight of this burden forever? Hope not. Thank you. Could you pass the microphone to the gentleman behind you? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I just have a question to, uh, I don't know whoever might be interested in, in or uh, answering it. Uh, you know, before the Trianon and the Versailles, Versailles treaties, there was more than a year of uh, 
discussions and negotiations and uh, lobbying in the Paris Peace Conference. It started in uh, January 1919, if not sooner. And uh, it just went on forever. And this was an occasion for everybody to, and by everybody I mean all the different nationalities, countries, small countries, informal delegations. And yes, I think there were some Indians there. Uh, and they were still paying attention, at least lip service, to Wilson's 14 points, which actually had 72 points, but that's another story. But, po but my point is simply that um, c countries such as Romania, uh, the Czechs, uh, Croatians, they all made major efforts to try to influence whatever was coming out of that conference, not just at the political level, but at the informal. It was major lobbying. And um, they were using not only for, uh, formal delegations, but informal. The uh, diaspora of these different nationalities uh, was pretty active. And my question is simply, what did Hungary do? Because there was a Hungarian uh, diaspora. It did have friends and, and uh, certainly blood relations uh, with the English and French and other aristocracies. And, uh, I have, I'm not a, I'm just an amateur, but I haven't seen any uh, references, or to, not, nothing about what the Hungarian efforts were in this, in this uh, period leading up to the signing of the Treaty of Trianon. Well, I think uh, very little uh, decided the fate of Hungary in a, in a very little way uh, what happened after the end of the war. In fact, uh, the, the very borders, if not drawn exactly, but uh, the sketches in broad outlines, they were ready. So uh, when the question was uh, uh, certain towns, uh, whether they will remain with Hungary or outside that. Uh, lobbying, uh, well, uh, certainly uh, the so-called victors, including the so-called successor states representatives, were very active in Paris. Uh, but uh, uh, their efforts, uh, I don't see that uh, brought much, much result because uh, uh, it was the great powers, the big three, the big four, uh, who decided and their foreign ministers and their experts. So uh, they tended to look down upon the smaller nations, including the Romanians. Uh, uh, well, Masaryk was a somewhat different case. Uh, and he was a kind of authority. Uh, but, uh, uh, he, well, Hungarians were not allowed uh, to lobby. Uh, Miklos Banfi, uh, uh, with the, uh, well, not only with the well wishes of all his Hungarian uh, colleagues, uh, aristocrats, and friends, uh, but also with the Karui government's uh, support, tried uh, to go to Britain and to France, but uh, as enemy alien, uh, he was not admitted, so he could not go further than Holland. Uh, but even if he had been able to, uh, even to call upon some friends, uh, it would have uh, had no result, uh, uh, because uh, the broad outlines that uh, the monarchy should be broken up to national units, and these units uh, will be the mainstay uh, of the new European order in the back of Germany will be the allies of France. So that was the decisive. And uh, as I said, perhaps these uh, friends or, or uh, unfriendly observers and, and uh, experts influenced only just uh, a, a little part of the territory, but uh, not the whole uh, attitude. And uh, to the earlier uh, intervention or, or question, uh, I think uh, Hungarians uh, willy-nilly, uh, obviously, accept uh, Trianon and uh, uh, do not dream about serious people, do not dream about uh, any substantial change in borders, uh, but uh, it will always remain a wound and uh, the remedy, the healing, uh, would depend on our good friends, our allies, uh, how uh, they accept uh, th that they have a Hungarian minority and this minority is to stay and to have language rights, which is very slowly gaining ground. And uh, with more European support and friends, I think uh, our neighbors, and of course, with, with the good foreign relations with the neighbors, we will come to the point when uh, the existing or imaginary grievances of the Hungarians 
will disappear. And then uh, with the borders in the European Union uh, become invisible and hopefully not in the far distant future, we will have just what we had in the monarchy. We will have a common foreign policy. We will have a common army, NATO or European army, I have a common currency, and of course, a common economic territory. Uh, then uh, it will be each locality to opt uh, for what language he or she or the, the village or the town uses, or more languages as in the old monarchy, uh, people were multilingual. So if uh, uh, Hungarian will be taught, not only in Hungarian schools in Romania and in Slovakia, but even those Romanians who uh, want to learn Hungarian or Slovaks can learn in their own school uh, some Hungarian, then I think uh, the, the wound will be healed. You mentioned that there we don't learn from our mistakes, and you are sort of right, but if you look at the 20th century, what you see is that uh, the Hungarians were jumping from one obsession to the other, right? We had the constitutional kind of obsession, then we had the uh, revisionist obsession, and then after the Second World War, another obsession of, uh, obsession of the country of iron and steel was forced up on us. And then finally, since 1990, I hope at least we have been obsession free, or at least this is what we should do. Th that would be one point of, of learning. Uh, getting back to your question about the, when Trianon will heal, I think Schengen borders are a piece of healing and also some minority rights, some more excessive minority rights would do good as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask for um, one final question. In that case, I will ask a final question myself and invite the three speakers to answer it, but also to accompany it with the, their closing remarks. And the question really is, um, the debate, the discussions at, uh, in, uh, in Paris were taking place against a background of extraordinary turbulence, not simply in Hungary, but in the whole of Eastern Europe. I mean, after all, you had already had uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, you had Czech troops for fighting the, the Bolsheviks in Russia. Um, you had the Belakun provisional uh, government here, um, and you had um, uprisings in Munich and elsewhere. So throughout Europe, you have a feeling of the old order being completely overthrown. And I wonder whether or not, in looking, acting against this background, without incidentally the participation of Hungarian diplomatic representatives, I wonder if they, the, 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 the statesmen there said to themselves, um, we're living through a revolutionary period and we need to take decisive action, s setting the world on a new path. And I wonder why they didn't, it seems to me that might have been part of it, and I wonder why they didn't say, in a period of revolution of this kind, surely we, tr we should try to shore up the existing institutions that have provided order over a long time. What was it that, how did their d deliberations, how were they affected by the surrounding atmosphere of revolution? And then, um, if you could each answer that, beginning Professor Frank with you and ending with Professor Jasensky, and, um, and we will um, we'll end the meeting, thank you. I think one point was not uh, mentioned so far, and that, that is the uh, Republic of Cancer, the specific type of Republic in the summer of 19, uh, the spring and summer of 1919, which left um, a very uh, great imprint on the conference in Paris. A lot of people uh, felt that this is a direct influence of the budding uh, Soviet Russia and that it's a danger for Central Europe that uh, communism will spread over. I think that was uh, an, an imminent feeling uh, for many people outside Hungary also. Uh, and so they wanted to create a corridor of some sort, which would uh, cut off Russia from the rest of uh, Central Europe. Uh, this was also behind the creation of this relatively small countries instead of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, which was the, uh, uh, one of the top five empires in Europe and one of the top five military powers in Europe. So instead of that, uh, the, uh, 
presence of the two revolutions and then the counter-revolution in 1918, 1919, 1920, uh, that created a feeling of fear also in Paris and they wanted to do something about that. Uh, and they did. And that was one of the reasons that the, the question came up, why they cut off so much from Hungary you know, at the expense of Hungary. They also cut off a lot from Austria. Nobody uh, laments uh, about Austria losing uh, the Czech lands and parts of Poland today and parts of Ukraine today and uh, Slovenia, and, et cetera. So uh, Austria also lost, it became a small country. And it is a small country, and uh, you don't find many people in Austria lamenting about that. I'm not saying that uh, it is not understandable uh, to lament about what happened to Hungary, because every third family we have uh, members uh, outside the border. The, the greatest problem with German was that they cut off uh, ethnic uh, blocks, ethnic blocks, uh, ethnic Hungarians, uh, some three and a half million of them, from uh, mainland Hungary. So not only the territorial loss was uh, huge, but also the loss of Hungarians uh, who, who, who overnight found themselves in the neighboring countries. And that is still a wound in many families. This is not just a national wound, it's a personal wound in many families. This must be understood. Uh, most of us have family members outside the country. And the Hungarian diaspora is a very large diaspora. It's not as big as the Russian or the Jewish or some others, but it's very big in uh, contrast to the size of the country. And that is therefore not a German problem, it's also a problem of the emigration from the country already at the uh, end of the 19th century. Uh, some 4 million people left, altogether 4 million, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy for the United States, and roughly 1.5 to 2 million uh, from Hungary. I say from Hungary, not necessarily Hungarian, but a lot of Slovaks also left, for example, there were 2.8 million Slovaks in what is today Slovakia. Uh, 700,000 of those left for the United States. This is just an example of the losses of the country before Chernobyl, before everything started to go wrong. So this is a complex pattern why Hungarians are sad about Chernobyl. And Chernobyl is like a, a, a center of the, of the problem. Not the whole problem. It's, it's something like a, a way to remember all the losses of Hungary from the 1880s onwards. Once again, immigration was uh, rampant in the country and it left Hungary without a lot of uh, excellent people who could have worked uh, in Hungary. Yeah, I would like to continue uh, Professor Frank's uh, story about the Austrian loss and talking about the German loss a little bit, uh, getting back to your question that you mentioned some time ago, that Germany was not so affected, and I think Germany was very much affected, but not so much territorially, but prestige-wise. So someone should write the book of lost prestige for Germany. Before the war, they were dreaming of a superpower. They were economically absolutely top, right ahead of Britain. And then what happened? The truncated, totally uh, un annihilated uh, sense of national consciousness. And then the result out of Hitler, we all know. So probably their loss was even, even bigger than uh, Hungarians are not very good at compromise, not very good at uh, accepting their lots, but we should look at some other countries, I think, sometimes. Thank you. Uh, Tibor already pointed out, uh, but did not uh, expand the subject, uh, Bolshevism and uh, the peace treaties, and especially the peace treaty of Trianon. Uh, well, as uh, uh, those of you who are Hungarians and who know Hungarian history uh, reasonably well are aware that uh, the Karui government, uh, which uh, came to power and uh, accepted uh, how to deal uh, with uh, uh, the crisis which they did not participate in making. Uh, but uh, they 
had their hopes uh, in President Wilson uh, in the 14 points and uh, in self-government, uh, the principle of self-government, national self-determination. And uh, why they rapidly lost uh, uh, their own popularity uh, was very much due to the victors uh, who instead of uh, inviting the, them uh, to really what was not a peace conference but only a preliminary conference of the victors, but in fact uh, uh, thinking that, well, this is just a Hungarian disguise and another count is now uh, heading the country of the Junkers, uh, so uh, Karu was not uh, accepted really as a Democrat, which he was, whether he was not very competent a person, but uh, he really meant well uh, to be a pro entant Democrat even before the war ended. Uh, now, uh, that explains also why Hungary, or at least a part of Hungary, uh, accepted Bolshevism, uh, not really being aware of uh, the doctrines of Marx. Uh, even the Bolshevik leaders did not read much of Marx. But uh, uh, a new orientation, if the Entente uh, is not ready to live up to its very promises, the 14 points, and self-determination, uh, and uh, allows uh, uh, all the Hungarian, all the neighbors of Hungary to invade the Hungary, uh, to invade the country and uh, to occupy the territory which they uh, claimed and coveted, and in fact a little bit more, the Serbs were occupying, of course, uh, uh, Pech and Baja, so well over, and Romanians were on the Tisza. Uh, so then, uh, in exasperation, uh, Hungarians turned to Russia, Soviet Russia, thinking uh, that, uh, well, their invasion, they were uh, proceeding uh, westward. And they thought that, well, perhaps now, uh, being allied to Russia will save, if not the whole old historical territory of Hungary, but uh, at least the ethnically Hungarian uh, territories. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there was fear of, by the allies, the, by the victors of Bolshevism and the spread of Bolshevism. It was said that with Bolshevism coming to Hungary, that doctrine uh, came to uh, 36 hours distance from Paris. And of course, Germany was in the danger. Yes, in January of 1919, the Spartakists, the Bolsheviks, uh, Germans were defeated. But Germany had a government of social democrats who were certainly not pro-allies. So the danger was uh, seen by the tech victors that uh, Bolshevism may, uh, come, has come already to Hungary, will win Germany, and who knows what will happen in France and so on. So uh, that. Uh, the conclusion was, and uh, that was borne out by facts, that uh, the only nationalism and national uh, aggrandizement, national uh, helping the nationalism, or recognizing the nationalism and helping Romanians, Slovaks, Serbs, uh, they will be neutral or they will be very unlikely to accept national, uh, Bolshevism. So the antidote, the medicine against Bolshevism is nationalism supporting uh, the, the neighbors of Hungary, the national former minorities uh, uh, who will uh, not succumb uh, to these, to some people, attractive doctrines of Bolshevism. <laughs> and uh, so that is again the ill luck of Hungary that uh, for understandable reasons, uh, uh, Hungarians, uh, some leaders turned towards Soviet Union and Soviet Russia and uh, that did not influence the very borders. So it is uh, uh, not true what uh, had been thought earlier and today too. Some people think that uh, Trianon was a kind of punishment uh, for Bolshevism. This is not true. Perhaps uh, that uh, this Burgenland passed to Austria, it was to some degree influenced by that let's make sure that if Hungary remains Bolshevik, at least not the whole Old Kingdom should remain Bolshevik. And anyhow, West Hungary uh, was mainly inhabited by German speakers. Many of them had a Hungarian consciousness, uh, but uh, anyhow, the ethnic principle was more observed on the west court, uh, border of Hungary than on any other borders. And uh, finally, I may say one more word that uh, which I wanted to mention, that I am very proud of this cover. This is an engraving by Walter Crane, one of the uh, pro-Hungarian Britons, uh, uh, and uh, 
I am very grateful to Katalin Keserű. I don't know whether she is here or not. She planned to come, uh, the art historian who discovered this uh, for my first, for the second edition of my work, and uh, uh, Helena History Press and uh, Sebastian, it's uh, uh, well expert uh, made this cover, which I'm very proud of, and it shows uh, Art Nouveau Hungary, which was uh, not only a bigger country, but a, a great uh, patron and a very successful country in the arts. On your behalf, I'd like to thank the three speakers today. I think we've had an intellectual feast. We, learn, we understand much more than we did before. I'd like um, to thank uh, Kathleen Kaidar Lin for this splendid book, which, and I agree entirely with the closing remarks that Geyser just made about Walter Crane, of course, one of the great uh, socialist artists of the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. And um, a conservative like myself still finds it wonderful stuff. And, and I love that particular movement in socialism. If only all socialists were those socialists. Um, thank you very much. And thank you to the three speakers.